Do you want to take it to your order? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you just check the sound over here, Nosh? Okay. 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 So, have Pavelina, do you want to test your audio? Hi. Hi, Sari. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And you? You're muted. Um, she can't hear me. Yes. She can't hear me on the Zoom. She can't. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Sari. Hello. Hello. Cherie, if it's helpful, I can hear you as well. I can hear you, Cherie. You can? I can. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Pavlina, you want to test yours? Sorry. So he's told me to switch off my mic on my laptop, which, which is why it's looking like it's muted and we're using the conference room mic. Can't hear you, Pavlina. Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, how does it look in the conference room? It looks good. You're on the screen. Um, I'll send you a picture. Will we see the room? I will send me a picture. You should. You should. Okay. I just need to talk to the guy from tech support. Can you, can, you stay around here eh? so I don't have to keep calling out to you. Hello, Roxana. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Oh, nice room. I hope it will not stay empty. <laughs> no, I think it will show up, but we have 20 minutes to go, right? Yes. Um, we discussed this in, before with Sheri that the timing of our session is right after lunch in uh, Addis Abeba. So, uh, you know, we know that it will affect the in-person participation. Um, but anyway, we'll be starting on time. I am um, I'm connecting from uh, Ankara. Oh, I wow. hope my connection will be fine. We've been figuring it for the last three hours. <laughs> so, um, looks good. How are you guys? All good over here. Any questions to the panel? Everyone feels comfortable with the questions. Uh, just one question from me, Pavlina. Just I see there are was it eight questions? Yes. Is that so? Just thinking through the mathematics. Uh, I mean, I think sometimes that you know the question will flow into one to another. Is there kind of a degree of flexibility in terms of when one question starts and then, of course, there will be points made? But I'm just thinking about. We're going to struggle to get to the end if people are sort of talking for three or four minutes per, per, per point. Open ended discussion. <laughs> Fine. Okay. It's just, you know, we outline it. I think some, for example, you know, some, some questions in the end are more detailed, such as, for example, um, like how the harm methodology can contribute to norm implementation. Like this is a very specialized question. If anyone, you know, feels free to, uh, to jump in if we get there, but I do understand there are many questions. We just wanted you to know what possible questions can be. Mm -hmm. um, and also be ready if, you know, if the discussion flows very fast and then we have, you know, we, we want to ask more questions and, uh, um, but, uh, on my side, uh, yes, only one thing I do understand that it's, uh, there's more, you know, free flowing discussion, feel free. Um, but, um, let's go from, you know, like, let's have some, some basic, let's go from more from the thread lens, thread landscape, more from like the general, you know, from the bigger picture to more detailed. So we have a story to be told, um, and, um, <clears throat> 
and it will be hard also for the participants to follow if we kind of like jump. I do understand that it's hard not to jump. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but if we first address, you know, that's also how we how we prepare the, the flow of the questions to tell a story from the larger threats we see, the need we see for measuring harm and sata, then to the questions. So that would be the first, then the, the first chunk, then why measuring harm is important, you know, how can we do it? and then like what it would address for especially for policymakers um so it is let's be coherent on this it would be it would be great also for me as a uh, as a as a moderator to be able to to follow on on the flow of the discussion um but yes it's free flowing discussions so okay, okay, just, just to recap yeah. we will we will start with a presentation from emma right yes i uh I asked her to start because um, because she has been leading on the harm methodology. Oh, absolutely, and I, I think it's great. But then, do you just uh, start asking the questions and you expect us to jump in, or do you want to direct the questions after Emma's presentation? Yeah. Um, we'll see if she gives me floor. Uh, I will then give floor to you with another question. If if you feel like you want to jump in and say something immediately afterwards, feel free to jump in. Okay. And do you expect us to have some opening remarks or directly into the questions? Because I realize we only have one hour, so it's going to be really quick. I know, last panel I moderated, I was just like, well, one hour and I was done. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. So you're going to keep us on track. But you don't expect us to have a, a quick um, uh, opening statement. Remarks about, do, do you have it prepared? Like, if you have it prepared, feel free to share it. I think, uh, I think we'll just no, no, take it I want where it for, Emma leaves it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I wanted it, exactly. I wanted it for Emma for two reasons. First, the organizer is the Cyber Peace Institute. Uh, and, and I think it's more interesting to hear from the speaker to introduce Cyber Peace Institute than from the moderator, because I already speak at the beginning. Um, and then secondly because uh because she has uh, she has been leading on the, on the harm methodology as it is now at the at the institute uh so she knows the most about where you know like where where do we stand and um and about the landscape so um okay that's great so the rest is really free flowing you'll ask them questions and then we 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 try to answer okay for your yeah, knowledge answer short something yes <laughs> as much um interaction as possible great yes um it would be great i hope that we will have also in-person participants the more questions the better and um you know because the session was also proposed in a um like in an attempt to get some um Mm, to get some views from uh, from other people, you know, to get some views from the from uh, uh, from the participants and from practitioners who, who hopefully will attend our session um, on how do you see the methodology, how do they see the approach, and and set out what can be the obstacles. Uh, so I really hope it will be. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, Hello. Hi, Roxana. Long time no see. See you, Emma. <laughs> it's been a while, yes.
Abina, I'm just going to disconnect and reconnect to see if my name will show up correctly. Give me just a minute. I'm getting a glass of water. I'll be back in uh, one minute. Nice background, Sherry. I wish I was there. <laughs> I'm just going to close the door. Cyber Peace Institute.
Hi, Pavlina. Hi, just checking. Um, would it be easier if, if, in terms of the flow of the conversation, if you wanted us to raise our hand when we wanted to make a point that is relevant to the previous content? And um, it might be sort of a month so happy to, to put, offer it on that basis. That's helpful for you. Sure, perfect. Sure, okay, great. Hold them on us. <laughs> I won't interrupt anyone. So people are coming back from lunch um, in Addis. So hopefully in a few minutes we can uh, we can see. Uh... Yeah. Okay. We have the yeah the room now. Yes, that's great. In fact, I think the lunch break runs till two o'clock. On Monday we had a session, and I know they they told us to not schedule anything till two o'clock because of uh, the overlap with lunch. And should we wait five more minutes for people together? Does it make difference? I think we can, yeah. So let's start at 
Uh, this speaker is going to be coming back in one minute, Pablo, no? Great, it's 11.50 uh, here. I believe it's um, it's more than that where you are. Uh, but uh, hello and welcome all of you who are connecting to our panel online from wherever country you are in right now or attending the session on site in Addis Abeba in Ethiopia, where the Internet Governance Forum is taking place this week. I'm extremely thrilled to welcome you at this session on behalf of the Cyber Peace Institute. My name is Pavlina Pavlova. I'm the Research and Project Management Associate at the Institute, and I will be the online moderator for this session today. Our event takes place in a hybrid format, and I will now give the floor to Sheri Lagakali, our on-site moderator, to provide you with some technical instructions um, about the participation in the session. Thank you, Pavlina. Good afternoon to everybody in the room. My name is uh, Shuri Langakali. I'm from Fiji. I am the Senior Advisor Pacific Cyber for the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. I'm also a MAG member and assisting Pavlina to make sure that there is a good exchange between the on-site and the virtual participants. For those of us in the room, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, when you get selected, please just um, say your name before you uh, your intervention. Thank you. Over to you, Pavlina. Thank you very much for the introduction, Sherry, and thank you very much for agreeing to being our on-site moderator. Uh, this session prepared by the Cyber Peace Institute in Geneva will discuss harm in cyberspace and more precisely how we can build a framework for measuring the harm stemming from cyber attacks. Please send your questions and comments into the chat or use the use the hand function um, as, uh, as Sherry pointed out. Um, for the questions, please use the um, Zoom platform and uh, and the chat space you have uh, at the bottom. And we'll address your comments and questions in a QA. Um, and we got some wonderful experts as panelists today, and I am very happy to introduce them. Um, we have Emma Rafrai with us, Chief Research um, and Analysis Officer from the Cyber Peace Institute in Geneva. Hello, Emma. We have Roxana Radu, a lecturer in technology and public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Hello, Roxana. And uh, we have Peter Stephens, uh, policy advisor from OECD. Hello, Peter. Um, I will now give the floor to our first speaker, Emma. Uh, who will introduce the work of the Cyber Peace Institute and the HAR methodology before we drive uh, more further into the questions. Thank you very much, Pavina, and thanks everybody for joining us today. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to walk you through a little bit of the work that we've been doing uh, recently at the Institute related to um, the measurement and assessment of the impact and harm from cyber attacks. So just a very quick background on the Cyber Peace Institute for those of you who don't know us. Um, we're a non-governmental organization based in Geneva, and really our primary mission is to actually reduce the harm from cyber attacks on people's lives. And we do this through, through three, three different strands of activities, where first of all, we assist vulnerable communities in terms of improving their cybersecurity posture, for example. We analyze the threats from cyber attacks on those communities, and then we look to advance the norms and responsible behavior in cyberspace. And really at the core of our mission, in terms of understanding harm, we recognized quite early on that there is a significant lack of data available um, related to cyber attacks, where they're happening, why they're happening, how they're happening, 
but more notably, what is the harm that is actually generated as a result of these attacks? And in order to do this, we started to document and track cyber attacks and incidents against um, different communities. So one of these is the healthcare sector, and the other are communities in conflict zones, where we've done a lot of work related to cyber attacks in the context of the war in Ukraine. And we're also looking at uh, threats to uh, the NGOs and nonprofits um, operating notably in the humanitarian space. And basically, as we started to track and document these attacks and the impact and harm that they caused, we realized that a lot of efforts related to the documenting of um, harm and impact were actually related to direct impact to targeted systems or organizations. So we're talking about things like time to restore, financial cost, and to some extent, um, the number of records that were breached, for example, in a particular attack. But we realized that this very narrow assessment of impact of cyber attacks actually misses a fundamental element which is what is the harm that attacks are causing to people, communities, and society. So perhaps to sort of um, get the conversation started today, I wanted to walk you through a case that really stood out for us in terms of the varying components of impact and harm uh, that were notable. So there was a cyber um, attack that took place against a psychotherapy center in Finland, in which 25 of their centers were impacted. The initial breaches happened in 2018 and 2019, but then it was only in September 2020 that the organization was subjected to a ransom request. The organization refused to pay the ransom, and as a result, the attackers began posting batches of patient records on underground forums and requesting that patients pay 500 euros to have their information taken offline. Approximately 36,000 patient records, including juveniles, were stolen. It contained highly pe sensitive personal data, including names, contact details, social security numbers, and records of therapy sessions of some of the most vulnerable in society, as well as the healthcare professionals who treated them. Around 30,000 people are believed to have received a ransom demand themselves, and over 25,000 people actually reported um, the, um, the incident to police. A 10 gigabyte data file containing private notes between at least 2,000 patients and their therapists appeared on the dark web. And to wrap this all up, following this specific incident or series of incidents, and um, this organization had to file for bankruptcy and the organization ceased to operate in March 2021, leading all of its patients and customers having to look for new services for their psychotherapy treatment. So I wanted to leave you with that as an initial um, sort of scene setter for why we went into the development of harm methodology because we noted that there's a significant amount of information out there that relates to qualitative aspects of harm that are associated with cyber attacks and we started to question how we can bring together that qualitative data into potential quantitative indicators of harm and eventually look to measure and assess the harm in a way that is converted into sort of mathematical formula to be able to compare, for example, um, the severity and degree of harm that different cyber attacks are causing to people. Thanks, Pavlina. Hand back to you. Thank you very much, Emma. It was extremely impressive uh, introduction to the topic. Thank you for uh, speaking especially about the impacts on vulnerable people. That's why also the Cyber Peace Institute is paying so much attention to the to the selected topic you described. Um, <clears throat> and um, thank you for pointing the re-victimization and the far-reaching and long-term effects cyber attacks can have. Uh, which are not only online, but uh, importantly offline. Um, to follow up on uh, on the introduction, I would like to <clears throat> go to the to the trend landscape that we are seeing. And you you started you started pointing out, um, especially with the with the great uh, case study um, in Finland. Uh, but I would like to hear also from uh, from other panelists, uh, what is the trend landscape, uh, and what are the impacts we see. Uh, Roxana, do you want to take it? Ah, Peter. 
Thank you, Pepina, and thank you, Emma, for the great presentation. I, I hadn't, I wasn't familiar with that particular example you mentioned. Um, as you say, the, the, the interconnected relationship between uh, the products that we own, uh, the infrastructure that we rely on, and connected technologies is 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 completely fused. So harm can manifest in any possible myriad of ways. And um, we know that, as we heard, that there's, there's possibility for ransomware. Um, also possibility for this harm to be, you know, in some cases physical, you know, we talk about internet connected devices, in some cases with a heating element have been used and can be used to start, to start fires. We know there's questions about whether or not there have been fatalities associated with cyber attack, um, particularly re with reference to sort of infrastructure within Germany with, um, with ambulances. So I, I think it's incredibly broad in terms of what this is. And of course, it is, it is very scary. And I think for many people, we have to recognize most people who use these products are, are trusting them currently. They don't know um, what to look for in terms of um, what means good cybersecurity. And then also, if we think about the end in mind, um, policymakers are trying to think about how can they prioritize the intervention they need to take, which will do the most to reduce cyber, cyber risk and increase cyber resilience. So it's incredibly complicated. And I'm really so proud and so impressed with the work that's going on in the CPI um, to help to address this problem. I do think there is a broader question about how can we move towards an empirical assessment of cyber resilience and of risk, because I think that this is, it is a very challenging question to answer. And I think my, my personal reflection um, this is from working in the UK government as well, where we led a piece of legislation as a response to the Mirai attack. Um, we had to um, think about what, uh, how can we assess the, the, the potential impact of our legislation, of our policy interventions, as having a cost associated with, associated with them. Every piece of legislation will at some point need to go through the impact assessment process. So that's something that I think is, is really, I'd love to dig into a bit more as the panel proceeds, but just as sort of starting remarks about that as well. Um, I think I'm, I'm really, thank you very much, Emma, for your, your opening remarks, and um, I'm very interested to hearing others on the panel as well. Thank you, Peter. Just to follow up on what you were saying, I think ransomware tops uh, most of um, the disruptions we're seeing online right now. But obviously, it's not the only um, the only uh, harm inducing uh, activity. Alongside uh, data breaches, we've seen um, we've seen uh, ransomware being uh, top of the agenda right now. In the news just um, earlier this week, um, the special uh, COBRA meeting here in the UK, for example, has uh, ransomware uh, on the agenda more often than many, any other um, cyber activity or even criminal activity of sorts. So it has become uh, really, really important to fight this type of, um, of um, uh, activity online, but it it's mean, it only means uh, we also have to have the tools uh, to proper, properly understand it and uh, understand its impact. Uh, so ransomware has been bringing down countries, see the case of uh, Costa Rica and the paralysis generated by it, but also individuals and communities. And I think Emma's example uh, speaks um, um, very clearly about that, just um, how you can bring down entire categories um, of um, of uh, and sectors. Basically, you can go from patients to uh, medical professionals and also uh, to individuals themselves. So we're no longer talking about small scale operations, but about services and infrastructure designed to induce harm. And that's where the problem lies, that we live in a space in which there's very little accountability for these large scale um, activities and cyber criminal networks uh, that have the power to bring down individuals and countries. I think it's really key to to develop uh, a methodology that allows us to better understand this and have this refined analysis of uh, of the the effects at different levels. There's obviously a direct effect on a particular individual that is called up by a uh, cyber criminal to 
uh, pay a ransom, but there's also an effect at the level of trust that uh, is obviously distributed across the community. There's also an effect on um, just um, how much you might uh, you might be incentivized to go back to your medical health professional if uh, this tends to happen every other day. So it's really key to understand uh, all of these uh, impacts and to to be able to have a policy conversation around the one needs to be done sooner rather than later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, exactly what we are hearing is a lot of trust and it's trust on all sides. It's trust in the products, it's trust in the government, it's it's uh, trust in those who are offering those uh, those services and the ransomware has been and criminal groups through ransomware have been having a lot of power which can impact countries. Uh, so it's not just uh, human security we are talking about, it's also, uh, it's also international security and national security. Um, we are discussing and Emma, I wanted to uh, come in with some remarks. Yeah, I mean, really, it's just to, to jump on a couple of things. I mean, Peter mentioned uh, a really interesting point also looking at the impact of uh, potentially legislation or some of the, the policy decisions that are um, that, that are being put into place. And I think it's uh, interesting, actually, in, in the case of the, the, the Finland attack, um, there's a couple of things that actually happened as a result of this. So first of all, there's the ongoing investigation right under a criminal law aspect. But there is also, um, you know, the organization has actually found to infringe GDPR and was issued with administrative fines and reprimands. So there are there is also the application of um, of you know regulatory and uh, legal means within this. But there were also some decisions that were made very soon after the attack took place, um, to actually look at how we could supply, for example, patients or members of the public with new social security numbers, um, in the aftermath of a breach like this, where they could then potentially uh, avoid some of the issues related, for example, to identity theft, which could be really harms that are several degrees away from the immediate harm that you can measure directly from the cyber attack, but could lead to sort of re-victimization issues. So um, that's just something I, I wanted to mention. And then also on the sort of threat landscape side, um, I mean, ransomware and data breaches, I mean, they're, they're big ones that we're looking into. But I think in the context of Ukraine, we've also got um, looking into some of the concerning trends related to distributor, distributed denial of service attacks, um, which, you know, although more temporary in nature in terms of taking down some of the infrastructure and predominantly websites, this is having an impact on civilians um, who are, for instance, interrupted in their ability to purchase um, transportation tickets, for example, where they might need to be taking a train or a bus. Um, so these sorts of attacks are also some of the things that are, are important to, to look into. Um, but also cyber attacks that are um, leading to interference in, um, in relation to the communication of factual information, no notably attacks on the media, for example. And we've noted um, a significant number of attacks where actually um, cyber attacks or intrusions into systems are being used to spread spread disinformation um, to the public and to spread propaganda. And this is particularly concerning because we're looking here at psychological harms and the harms that are so difficult to quantify, um, but needs to be looked into, into how far they are actually impacting um, a population's ability to, um, to, to take the right decisions in very, very difficult circumstances. Um, and the other thing that I also wanted to, to raise in terms of trends and threats is what we're looking at in terms of the the use of or the misuse of uh, spyware technologies and how the targeted surveillance of individuals in this case, and sometimes individuals who work for specific types of organizations, um, how the um, you know surveying of their calls, their messages, their audio, um, is actually being used as an instrument for persecution. And again, these are things that are going to be very, very difficult to quantify in terms of harm, but they're things that I think are interesting to, to group into this bucket of threat landscape. Thank you, Hannah. I, I, I definitely agree. First of all, I very much agree for uh, your focus on DDoS, um, because uh, you know I think that we can see that particularly in light of the COVID pandemic, um, more and more people and more and more organizations are more reliant 
um, on their connected products. And so we've seen the explosion of these devices being used around the world. Um, I think I saw a statistic saying that the number of devices the average UK US household has has gone from 13 to 16 it's in, from 2020 to 2022. So that's just an increase of the threat landscape that is a, that is existing there. So I, I would always look at uh, the internet connected devices and DDoS attacks. Um, I also think that there is there's a challenge about the number of people, businesses, institutions who aren't necessarily targeted, but are just caught in the crossfire because through no fault of their own, some component across their myriad of products and their supply chains is in some way vulnerable and is as a default password. You know, I know I've seen that in Japan they are running a project which is assessing the number of internet connected devices um, which uh, have a user universal password. Just and I think it's you know, the number of devices. If we look back 2016. Um, the Mirai attack was 100,000 devices from 61 password username combinations. Now in Japan, we have over 200,000 devices with just one. So that shows the expansion of this threat landscape and just how much growth there is of potential damage there. And it's hard to, to show how can we assess that. And I think to Emma's point, a lot of what we're talking about is the, the challenges here of quantifying, because of course, we can hear horrible stories about kind of, as we talk about in Finland with a psychotherapy um, facility, which is compromised um, or other healthcare providers. And we can hear about sort of cameras um, in sensitive places being compromised and used in ways that the owners were never intended. Um, but it's very hard to, to, to break that down into a cost, because I think also this brings me back to my, my, my point about um, governments will always look at impact assessments and will always look at if they're designing legislation, how can we make this quantifiable? And yes, there has to be some degree of acceptance that it won't be a perfect science, but a recognition that there is a financial cost that comes with that. Because I think there's always that challenge, um, and we've experienced this as well, of um, consumers and organizations some cases responding to the big event that takes place. So, for example, I think cybersecurity um, issues do gain a lot more traction when there is a high media, high profile media story, um, which focuses hearts and minds. Um, I think the challenge that we have from that is, is, are we being empirical and are we looking at the most impactful and are we focusing on the, the biggest issues that matter there? Because I think it is an incredibly difficult thing to, to manage, but uh, it's great to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so what we are seeing is an explosion in the number, in the effect, the impact the cyber attacks are having. Um, different kinds from ransom, DDoS, um, propaganda and spyware from instant victimization, such as unavailability of some services. Uh, we see also other prolonged harm. Um, and other kinds of harm, uh, such as psychological harm, which must be very difficult to measure. Um, <clears throat> so there's, a, there's an obvious challenge in uh, qualifying those harms and importantly quantifying. And it's been mentioned several times that this is important to overcome for assessment if we want to make harm to people, part of the assessment for policy making and for decision making. So where would you say we are right now? What is the state of play with, uh, with measuring harm? How we, should, how we should approach the issue? What can be taken as an, are there any positive examples we already see in, a, in, a, in other fields? How can we, how can we start? Um, and how can we actually proceed from where we are now with measuring harm? Are there any possible case studies we can use? wants to take this uh emma can you go yeah i mean i think um I, I mentioned this earlier that actually we came across some big hurdles when we started to document um cyber attacks generally and then you know the harm and impact from cyber attacks because there's not a ton of research out there that exists um but there has been some good work that's already been done um there is an academics piece that's called a taxonomy of cyber harms and um, defining the impacts of cyber attacks and understanding how they propagate which was published back in october 2018 um which looked at sort of some of the sort of more high level taxonomy of harms which would look at you know sort of psychological physical um geographical types of harms and grouping them together so there there is a little bit of research out there um 
and sort of been having some conversations recently with a number of actors that are actually looking at this particular problematic. Um, but where are we in terms of the Institute? I mean, we are at the stage where we've got a very first draft of what we would consider a framework um, for um, measuring and assessing um, harm from cyber attacks. And when I talk about this framework, we've reached the point where we've already identified a number of indicators that we would be looking to include within this framework. Um, these indicators range from quantitative indicators. So if we think of number of records breached or a number of hours of downtime, so these are numerical values that would be feeding into these indicators. Then we've got uh, more qualitative indicators that could be converted to numerical values. So if we think about um, uh, certain indicators where you would have a yes or no option. So for example, was, uh, were, uh, was the web, did the website go down as a result of the cyber attack? This would be a, a yes no field that could be converted to a numerical zero to one value. And then we've got qualitative indicators. And this is really where we're looking at trying to document and track things such as psychological harm, issues related to trust, as, we, as was mentioned a couple of times today. Um, and really, at this stage, we've got those indicators and we've defined what would be a mathematical formula to kind of um, identify a initial score, in essence, for an individual attack. Um, but what we're missing right now is real contributions from the community that could help to, first of all, refine this framework, because we know that it's not um, comprehensive enough at the moment. Um, we're also looking to test the framework as it is today against different cyber attacks to see if the results that it generates actually make sense. Um, and then we're looking also for some peer review opportunities, right, to see how others can contribute to this. So I would say it's a starting point and it's something that we're looking to build or build on specifically in 2023 through um, some focus groups and some workshops um, to be able to actually look how far we can take this particular um, methodology and if it's useful for those um, within the community. So Emma mentioned a very important thing, and it's part of why we are here and why we convene this workshop, uh, that we we want to hear your contributions, what do you think, your questions, uh, which make us think about new possible uh, possible ways, how to approach it, new possible factors to count in, or maybe solutions. Uh, so please feel free to... Um, uh to brainstorm about the comments you have about your questions drop them in the chat uh or raise hand later on when we have uh q a um <clears throat> after the panelists um say the main remarks and um i would like to as, as part of also this uh question feel free to uh to jump in from the uh from the other with the other panelists but uh, i would also like to uh proceed to the um, uh, as, as you described, the, the methodological framework, why is it important and what it would change in a, um, in a policy making, how it would improve. And Peter, you already, uh, you already mentioned uh, some of it. Um, can you elaborate on your points as you see it from your uh, previous experience and expertise? Sure. So I think that the, the point I was... Uh, yeah. What I was making was about the relationship between within cybersecurity um, policymakers, of course, operate in a world where there is a, a, a there is a seemingly perpetual series of events that take place which raise the profile of the issue. And there's also an ongoing trend, which is how can we increase cyber resilience and how can we reduce cyber risk. And I think that we think of those as one of them is a kind of discrete events, and one of them is the the ongoing process. So. What I think we need to be doing is, um, my point was, you know, government will introduce legislation or will policy interventions in response to market failure. And those market failures take place um, when we think there's a, a disconnect between what is currently being, uh, what it, what's currently on the market and what um, people like to think there is in terms of security of the products that they have available to them. So, says you need to create a robust assessment to show um, impact again things like technical barriers to trade or the impact of your legislation and what it will mean um, for 
uh, for others um, and what it mean for business if we introduce some form of legislation which is designed to increase cyber resilience. Now, of course, doing so will always be scrutinized by parliamentary parliamentarians. And so it's really important that that is, that is clear. Now, I think that it's important to say that that needs to be a snapshot of progress as things are right now. Um, and, and then how can that move forward? Now, I think that um, a process that we went under with the, um, in the impact assessment in, in, uh, in the UK government was having to kind of make caveats and assessments about how can we quantify some of the many ranges of harms which have been discussed earlier to something which can then be said to be uh, put into a formula to suggest, well, actually, is legislation a proportionate response in light of that? Now, I think we can all agree that there is a problem that we do not have sufficient quantifiable evidence right now to enable policymakers to make that decision immediately. They have to, in some cases, use a piece of um, uh, research or, in some cases, um, assessments and assumptions as well. I, I think the things I would also say is that um, there, is, there is a lot of great work that's already taking place. We have the, the Cyber Peace Institute and their work is ready. Um, there are ongoing assessments, so work like the Internet of Things Security Foundation, who every year publish reports to show the adoption of security practices within manufacturers. That's an important assessment. It's not so much focused on harm, but it's focused on security principles within products. So that, I think, is also an important um, distinction as well. Um, I think that one more point for me is just to thinking about um, what the OECD is doing right now, a lot of it is focusing on how can we empower policymakers to know what good security looks like and how can we share a series of recommendations so that they can help to know what good cybersecurity resilience looks like and how can they make their, their economies more resilient. Now, of course, the next step from that will be how can we quantify progress against those recommendations. Now, that's something which I think is something which is on in, in the, the intention for the next few years, but it's something that we are working towards um, on how we do that. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of sort of areas there, but I hope that's helpful and I'm happy to pass back to Pavlina. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for pointing, you know, to the to the effect it can has on uh, on legislation and to the many actors who will be who will be using it. And and you mentioned something which is very very important, especially as we discuss methodology and and the framework, which is quite complex to make it also understandable for policymakers who will be making these decisions, who need to decide on whether to use it, who needs to decide uh, how to how to use it. And um, before we go to uh, to Roxana for her remarks, Emma had uh, Emma had comments on uh, on what has been said. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add. I mean, I'm, I'm by far not the uh, the policy expert in the room, so um, I'm going to touch on something slightly slightly different, but potentially connected. Is when we look beyond, um, you know, the the legislation related, for example, to security vendors and businesses. I wonder in how far actually being able to um, really put a measure on the impact and harm from cyber attacks actually could help also with the triaging process. So if we think about how resources are allocated by governments to certain key issues um, within society, um, you know, I, I wonder in how far some of that is actually based on, you know, the security safety of civilians or of citizens. So in essence, if we're you know, through our analysis, identify that cyber attacks actually create a security and safety threat to civilians or to citizens, um, you know, in how far maybe resources could be redirected or could be considered to be increased um, for the prevention, detection, investigation and prosecution of cyber attacks, which we know are heavily underinvested, um, underinvested in at the moment. And then the other thing that I'm also wondering, and I, again, I'm not sure if this is specifically related to policy, but it might be, is in how far, you know, we owe some degree of remediation and redress to the victims who have been subjected to harm from cyber attacks and in how far that needs to be a consideration. And in order to do that, uh, we need to be able to tangibly say what harm means. So I'm thinking about very specifically looking at um, 
uh, lawsuits that are taking place in in the United States at the moment, for example, against uh, healthcare organizations for whom patient data has been breached. Um, but there's actually a threshold of damage that has to be proven by the victim related to how much harm has actually been caused or how much damage has been caused to the victim. And uh, my question is, how do they know what that is? Because as far as I know, there isn't something out there that actually quantifies what that damage is. So, yeah, I just wonder in terms of remediation and redress, I, I think that could be an interesting angle to look at as well. Thank you. Thank you. And you mentioned a very important point, uh, getting the justice to the victims and those who are affected and how this could help to, to the efforts of um, <clears throat> of increasing trust and um, uh, and helping those who are affected. And uh, Roxana, please go ahead. Yeah, I would just reiterate that unless we link this to the accountability discussions, we're not really getting very far. It's absolutely crucial to raise the bar for everyone, but we need to do that in cybersecurity by having multiple stakeholders involved and having a clear accountability process in relation to it. So there's this general saying that if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. And it's true to a certain extent. It's not necessarily holding true across the board, but you need to be able to measure in relation to a solution that you want to find. I think it's it's um, key to make the problem visible, but also see how the, the evidence you're collecting feeds back into a broader um, public policy process and how it actually fosters accountability. Uh, because there are several ways to go about this. One is to just say, look, we've made the issue visible and um, now it's up to the other stakeholders to take it forward. The other way to do it is to say we work uh, with uh, a collective um, uh, interest in mind and we're gonna bring around the table all the right stakeholders and actually be part of that uh, decision making process and change something uh, the effects of cyber attacks tend to be quite localized so it is sometimes really really difficult to bring this to a global agenda uh, everybody's going to experience a little bit of harm in their local jurisdiction but putting that on the global agenda requires global support um, so measuring harm can be this first step towards a proper understanding, but it has to be part of a bigger process and it has to, um, um, to, to have multiple parties involved, whether that's, you know, the government changing legislative frameworks, as we just discussed, whether it's the private sector introducing new safeguards and raising the bar for everybody or it's civil society assisting uh, victims of cyber attacks. Without accountability, we continue to operate in this space with impunity where there's only more data to be collected and more to be um, said about the damage, but uh, very little to go after the cyber criminals. Uh, so we need um, to make sure that this is not operating in, in a silo and that it, it does change the incentive structure for cyber criminals at the end of the day. And maybe it changes that beyond the borders because that only means they reprofile their activities and move to another jurisdiction rather than um, uh, acting, uh, you know, um, if we act, if we collectively act on a global level, then they, they, uh, their incentive to continue to do so much harm uh, is, uh, is reduced. But if, uh, if we only tackle it in certain jurisdictions, then they're only going to move uh, to another place or target others. And because we generally tend to have these individual oriented frameworks where, um, as I was explaining, you know, the burden is mostly on the victim to prove the, har the harm, we're missing a collective approach. We don't have anything for communities. How do you go about NGOs that are targeted in different countries and they are brought down by cyber attacks? How do you go about entire groups of people in a country that are no longer um, safe from um, cyber harm? these kind of harms are not yet um, uh, properly uh, tackled in our le legislative frameworks. We simply don't have anything that actually protects communities as such. And maybe it's time to think about introducing new safeguards and new protections. I'll stop here for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxana, and thank you for bringing accountability into the picture. Um, 
which is uh, which is extremely important, and it's it is you know at the core of the mission of the of the institute. Um, I will give floor to uh, to Peter before before we proceed to uh, more questions about breaking silos. Uh, but um, before that, please pose your questions into the chat so we know whether we should open the floor for the uh, for the Q and A or just proceed with with questions from uh, from the moderators. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlina. I hope it's linked to breaking silos. But just to reiterate, I agree with Emma's point um, about. Um, uh, the importance of having the, you know, this being used for triage processes and also the really interesting point that came through from that was about insurance and about kind of liability because I think this is this has the potential to move sort of markets if there's a business interest for you know there is ex existing precedent set in a number of existing sectors to say if you encounter a range of harm in a place where you didn't expect it um, there is a compensation thresholds that exist and they have been established they've been set and that's that's a that's a potentially a helpful starting point. Um, now I think that cyber insurance is a very interesting area, um, and I think insurers have a really interesting role in this space as well. Thinking about you know re re redress um, and all of, and and what was the conversation that was previously had. I also think that uh, we talked a little bit about the, the slight challenges with regards to law enforcement. You know we talked about kind of the 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 fundamental global nature of cybersecurity and the fact that a perpetrator of an attack can very easily be based in one jurisdiction and perpetrate an attack where the victim is in another. Um, and this brings a really complicated question about um, cyber about norms, about how can something be prosecuted. So I think that, that that is a very challenging area. So I do think that that's something which, um, you know, there is a growing momentum behind um, how can we get some accepted norms around that. But I do, I also think that there's a really interesting possibility in the future around cyber insurance as well and, and, and liability questions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, we touched upon uh, many stakeholders in this field and uh, and many communities which still, as we said, like stay in uh, in silos for most of the for most of the discussion on this topic so far. So only up to this, we have cyber insurance, we have law enforcement, we have international community. Roxana also mentioned the challenge of representing different communities in different countries, very spare examples uh, who have shared, um, who, who may have shared experience, but in different contexts, how can we, build coalitions and who should be building coalitions on this topic is that you know the, I, I like the point of for example cyber insurers um is this is this a group which which has invested interest in in moving the discussion forward is this the diplomatic community uh is this a civil society sector uh who can lead the discussion who should lead the discussion who has the more potential for the resources and if it's a multi-stakeholder uh problem which is most probably is how to uh how to break um how to break the the barriers between different stakeholders and how to build coalitions between them what can be what can be some powers that bring the uh that bring the communities and different kind of uh actors together on this topic uh peter go ahead Thank you, Lavina. I think in terms of, um, of course, this is a very multi-stakeholder challenge. Everyone, need, we need to be working in partnership. I think we all have a collective ambition, which is that we are protecting users, individual, users, businesses, organizations from a range of harms. And the assessment of what those harms can be and how we quantify them is an important part of that puzzle. Um, there's also a question of how can we, in, how can we embed trust within the digital economy? Um, the digital economy is taking place very quickly and has a multitude of benefits, um, which we should be allowing citizens, businesses and organisations to, to embrace. Um, I can see there's a question from Alison, which is also talking about the importance of schools and the importance of awareness. I think that there's a really interesting question there, because I think that, of course, we want, we want um, as the world is changing so quickly, uh, young people to be uh, equipped with uh, some skills to enable them to flourish in that world. And a part of that is to enable them to have basic cyber cyber hygiene principles to, you know, important to recognize the importance of things like two factor authentication. Um, there's also a question, which is how can we prepare 
young people for a future world where there's a huge range of career opportunities for them in this world of cybersecurity. Because of course, there is a huge range of, of potential work in that space. And um, I think there's something which more and more young people need to be, to be equipping themselves with the skills. I think, however, the point I would make is that we shouldn't be expecting citizens to become experts in cybersecurity. I think that there has long been a, an expectation um, up to say that we should be uh, bringing awareness, making sure that young people or all people are educated about how to make sure they protect themselves from ransomware attacks. How can we make sure they have three random words for their passwords? Um, and we know, and research continues to show that, 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 that people's password hygiene is still not, not often great. And I think that um, we shouldn't be expecting, we should be empowering young people, and we should definitely be including that within our, um, our, our future plans. But also, I don't think that we should be expecting them to do so. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Like, uh, really interesting. Maybe I'll touch on the um, on the education um, just to, to sort of follow in the flow, and then I'll go back to Pavlina's qu uh, previous question on sort of the leading and co-leading multi-stakeholders. Um, but yeah, I think on the schools and education, I think it's, um, you know, it's extremely important. Actually, at the Cyber Peace Institute this year, we actually brought young students in, um, different age ranges, some of them in the 12-year-olds and some of them sort of more university level, um, to actually talk them through um, careers in cybersecurity, um, sort of like open days of discussions. And it's really, really eye-opening for them. It's actually quite surprising how how little people actually know is um, is happening in, in cyberspace, um, especially given that, you know, cyberspace isn't really a thing when we think about it. it. It's the real world today. I mean, everybody's lives are on their mobile phones and on their laptops. So I think that, you know, really in terms of the education and awareness raising, it's it's really important. Um, and, it, you know, the earlier we can get into, um, you know, increasing the uh, understanding of actually some of the simple steps that can be taken to protect your devices, um, you know, the earlier we can do it, the, the better. Um, in terms of the multi-stakeholder um, and who should lead, it's a good question, Pavlina. And I mean, my answer is why not have co-leads? And I think that there is a really good example of where this was done this year, um, or last year actually, is the um, multi-stakeholder compendium that was done on related to the healthcare sector, uh, where Microsoft and the Czech government and the Cyber Peace Institute as the civil society representative came to uh, came together to actually look at the harms from cyber attacks specifically on the healthcare sector. And through a series of different workshops, you actually had entities across the stakeholder community um, who actually brainstormed on what it actually meant in relation to um, the threats that the healthcare sector was facing and what potential recommendations could come out of that. And I think that approach is something I would like to test again and again on different thematics within the cybersecurity world with different sectors, um, because um, the sectors are facing very different issues. And I think it's one of the things that we're looking at um, with the development of the methodology for, for cyber attacks um, and the harm that they cause is actually should we be splitting the methodology um, based on sectors or based on the types of targets? Um, in essence, because the indicators that you're going to build are going to look very, very different if you're looking at a hospital um, that has very different different operational activities than if you have an energy company, for example. Um, so I think that engaging this, the multi-stakeholder community, but notably with the experts who work in the field, and um, so bringing in the healthcare professionals so they can give their interpretation of what impact and harm meant to their organization and to their ability to deliver their services, I think is going to be instrumental here. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Roxana. Yeah, I'll just add to this that there's quite a bit of stigma in this space when it comes to how we treat victims of cyber attacks. So there's still a taboo uh, to be overcome before we can actually think very clearly about the responsibilities of different stakeholders. So in a way, we all have some work to do when it comes to just accepting that any one of us will sooner rather than later fall victim to a cyber attack. It is just that widespread nowadays. And the more we are able to talk about it publicly and have the right uh, remedies in place, have the right frameworks in place to bring this to the fore, uh, the more it's a conversation starter rather than um, a topic we keep on the side. 
And once we've overcome this on a societal level, and it has to do with education as well, as Alison was pointing out in the chat, of course, not all the responsibility can be placed on schools when there are so many different levels of, uh, of um, problems all across the board. So it's, it's really difficult to say schools can actually uh, do everything in terms of education, whether it's parents or whether it's, uh, you know, student associations. On the school side, there's some work to do, but it's uh, clearly uh, more than that. So we have to think about all the responsibilities of uh, all the actors in the system. And it goes from the um, the liability for the manufacturer all the way to um, what uh, governments might do differently because they might want to increase uh, collective trust. So to me, the responsibility in this space has to be uh, distributed and it has to be also uh, up for conversation. It simply can't be that each sector defines their own role in this, like the cyber insurance uh, companies tend to do. They decide whether they want to cover certain damages or not. Governments decide whether they want to change certain parts of the legislation or not. I think it's more about these collective pressures and understanding that we all need to do a little bit more to change the situation. Thank you. Um, please feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask the questions yourself uh, instead of posting it uh, to the chat and we will be sure to give you floor. Um, I will have small two questions which arise from um, from our discussions. And one is we, we mentioned this that um, across the board for different sectors the um the framework for measuring it will be will be looking very differently is it still will it be still comparable is is the is the framework envisioned as something that you can still can compare across the board even though the harm is is very different so you can you can see different sectors of harm rather than having again uh sector specific things and and the second question we we mentioned so many stakeholders and we mentioned that this is collective issue and collective responsibility and also the leadership should be uh, should be multi stakeholder should be more partners coming together but as we are um as uh, where we are right now as Emma described with the, with the work of uh, of the cyber peace institute who is it uh from the from the community from the experts uh that you would especially like to hear from and reach out to for example to to the cyber peace institute uh or to the to the wider community um to extend this discussion uh because we we met here today to also discuss how the community can can come uh can come together you touch upon it so well it's just this is an opportunity for you if there is anyone you could call on as part of this panel who, who would that be whose contribution is is sold at this at this point Thanks, Pavlina. Um, so two tricky questions on the, um, you know, if we were to develop the methodology looking at sector specific aspects, I mean, there are other parts and we, we can't go into to the details of this today for, for the matter of timing. Um, but there are actually parts of the framework that would look at generic indicators of harm that are applicable across any sector. So the idea would be that you could have um, sub scores that would look at your generic indicators that are comparable no matter what sector you're in, that could be comparable no matter what type of attack you've suffered. Um, but then there might be specific indicators that are relevant to your sector or to the type of attack, for example. And the idea is that these scores then come together to create a single score. But in essence, the sub scores might be very relevant in terms of comparing um, an attack that's happened in one sector against an attack in another. But something that we've been very keen to stay away from for now is the notion of an index that allows for, um, you know, the uh, concept of harm and impact from cyber attacks to be compared across geographies or to be compared across sectors. That's really not the purpose of the, the methodology that we're developing. What we're really looking to develop is an understanding of harm per incidence and looking at, you know, 
how incidents are comparable to each other, rather than looking at an index that would compare a country's performance in terms of the harm that is um, that, that is allocated. And there's a number of different reasons for that. I know we, I'm happy to jump on another discussion on this uh, another time. Um, but certainly, yes, I think that there would be some opportunities to compare different attacks from different sectors uh, based on um, how we actually build this um, this this scoring mechanism. Um, in terms of the community that we're looking to outreach, I mean, it, it could be very, very varied here. So we're interested in speaking to economists and mathematicians. So those who've worked with mathematical models, I think that this is going to be very important in terms of being able to um, to ensure that the model that we're going to be building is actually a stance uh, the test of scrutiny in relation to mathematical um, components. There's the cybersecurity experts that need to come in here who are going to have the knowledge and and expertise related to cyber attacks and what we are going to be able to acquire related to um, specific um, cyber incidents and cyber attacks that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you've got, of course, the, the policy makers and those who are going to be telling us what is going to be the value that is generated from a methodology and what is it that they need um, this specific methodology to do in order for them to be able to use it in their day to day activities. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we keep hearing is that, you know, governments might want this to be converted into a financial cost. That's not at all what we want to do at the Institute, because we want to make this human centric. We don't want to make this a financial measurement of harm. So in essence, it would be interesting to get these different actors in a room to understand why there is certain um, need to convert this into a financial metric, when in essence, we would be more inclined to keep this towards a um, a human centric metric of harm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. So we, uh, you've heard the call, uh, economists and mathematicians, policymakers and cybersecurity experts, please get in touch with us. And thank you, Emma, for pointing out um, the human centricism, which is uh, the human centric approach, which is at the core of the of the Institute and why we are developing this methodology. And we have both uh, Peter and Roxana to take the floor. So please go ahead, Roxana. I'll just be very quick on your first question. I think there's a lot of value in understanding results and findings in relation to harm and impact across the board, so looking at different sectors, potentially also different geographies, but obviously if there's very little space for comparison, each case will have its own uh, specifics. So it is mostly about changing the focus from having simply the analysis to having the analysis in relation to potential actions that could be taken to avoid that being repeated in the future. Um, from my point of view, it would be really important to link this back to the accountability framework. So as soon as we have the detailed analysis of, a, of, an, uh, of an incident, as soon as we have a proper assessment of the harm and the multiple levels of harm um, that, were, um, that were brought about by this uh, specific incident, that this actually fits into a process and then there's collective work so that we make sure it's not repeated in the future, whether that's simply about raising the awareness of all the stakeholders that one type of attack could have all these multiple uh, effects, or if that's really about how do we go about prosecuting the criminals behind, it really should be part of that bigger conversation. And on your second point, uh, Pavlina, who should um, be called to um, to bring um, additional expertise to the table? I think academia has a role to play here. Um, whether that's really from um, just uh, eliminating theoretical possibilities that just uh, shouldn't waste anybody's time. So really on the matter of what has proven not to work in the past, all the way to what might actually work with some uh, examples and insights from, from other fields as well. Thank you. Uh, just to, 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 to go off of some of the points that have already been made, um, to your first question, Pavlina, you know, of course, I think it's come across in this message um, that this is a multi-stakeholder endeavour. We need uh, perspectives from governments, academia, cybersecurity research community, um, industry, the third sector, um, and many other organisations, <clears throat> supranational organisations as well. Um, 
and they will play a very valuable role um, in helping to make sure we share a same language. I, I think there's there's always challenges when you have um, particularly security research community, so previously known as hackers, um, who would um, be able to sometimes have to translate what they are saying to policy. And I think that's a really important partnership. And also with academia as well, there's a need to share a number of different languages and how they can be um, coalesced around the same ambition, which is fundamentally to, to protect people from harm. Um, to, to Emma's point, I think she, she asked the question about, um, you know, how can we, you know, the challenges are that in, in a practical sense, legislation needs to go through a fundamentally financial hurdle before it can be approved. And so that's 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 the reality of, of the world where you know when you when government has to make a decision whether or not they will apply incentives on industry, recognizing there will be a knock-on consequence of that, there has to be evidence to show that there is a financial benefit to, to, to account for that. So I think the challenge here is recognizing that the realities of the world we live in and the way the legislation is developed, the way that government operations um, take place, and think about how we can again translate. The existing work into things that can help us and help make it usable for those purposes. So I guess that this, this comes back to the question that was raised about how can we translate those issues around the, the various range of harms into something that is then usable for those kind of products because I think that's a real challenge that I remember very vividly going through of like knowing full well that there was the range of harms available to us but because it was very difficult to quantify that it's very difficult to then input that into the model which you sufficiently need to get the, the to get what you need. So I think that's that's a really sort of important sort of uh, role about how we can all work together on that. And again, I think the theme that's coming through for me is around making sure that we're aware about when we're speaking slightly different languages and how can we nuance it so that we are preparing for the end in mind, which is fundamentally progress for government operations and for cyber norms um, to make sure that, that, that there is progress being made. Thank you very much, Peter. It was uh, it was very nice closing remarks. Uh, but uh, before officially closing the session, as we reached our time, I would like to give the last opportunity for our participants uh, who may want to raise the hand or or have any comment. So um, here's a here's. A, uh, some some 10 seconds to express your interest to speak at this session. And uh, I will also reach to the panelists if you have any remarks which haven't been said, and you want to wrap up the session, feel free to raise your hand. And I will make sure to give you the floor. And as I see no hands raised, um, I will just thank everyone for coming to our session. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we understand this is a complex topic, but it's a very important uh, conversation to have. As we said, this is a shared responsibility. It was highlighting all through our uh, our workshop today, and um, um, and it's so important to to get the the harm methodology right because we need to build trust and protect and expand the online spaces so they can serve to their to their purpose. They can serve to people and to um, and to increase their security, to increase their well being and and the prosperity of our societies. And I also believe that uh, as we mentioned, the importance of raising awareness. Um, about this topic, we had a very effective awareness raising exercise with this session. And um, and thank you very much, everyone who attended and see you at some other opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlina. Thank you, thank you everybody. Bye.